Phyllis Bennis is a fellow and director of the new internationalism program of the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C. She's also a fellow of the Transnational Institute in Amsterdam. Her areas of expertise include U.S. unilateralism, the Middle East, particularly Israel, Palestine, and Iraq, and U.S.-United Nations relations. While working as a journalist at the United Nations during the run-up to the 1990-91 Persian Gulf War, Bennis began researching U.S. domination of the U.N., and she stayed involved in work on Iraq sanctions and disarmament, and later the U.S. war and occupation in Iraq. In 1999, she accompanied a group of congressional aides to Iraq to examine the impact of U.S.-led economic sanctions on humanitarian conditions there. In 2001, she helped found and currently co-chairs the U.S. campaign to end Israeli occupation. She works closely with the United for Peace and Justice Anti-War Coalition, and since 2002 has played an active role in the growing global peace movement. Bennis's newest book, Before and After U.S. Foreign Policy and the War on Terrorism, is available in, in the lobby. She's also co-author of Calling the Shots, How, the Was How Washington Dominates the United Nations. Her work has appeared in the Baltimore Sun, Christian Science Monitor, Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the New York Times, The Nation, The Washington Post, Mother Jones, and Middle East International. Bennis appears frequently as a commentator, analyst on U.S. and international television and radio programs, including The News Hour with Jim Lehrer, The CBS Morning Show, NPR, and many others, including CNN, BBC, Fox, and Al Jazeera TV. She has testified in numerous U.S. congressional hearings on Iraq, Yugoslavia, and other issues. She has also drafted floor speeches and legislation at the request of members of Congress. Bennis has also been a featured speaker at United Nations conferences on Palestine and other U.N. questions in Athens, Prague, New Delhi, Paris, Havana, New York, and Madrid. She regularly briefs UN and Washington-based diplomats, journalists, and parliamentarians. She has addressed the European Parliament in Brussels and French and Swedish foreign ministry officials on expanding Europe's role in the Middle East and the Dutch Parliament on Iraq sanctions. She has lectured at Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Berkeley, Georgetown, MIT, Columbia University, and you can add K-State to that list tonight. Okay. Please join me in welcoming Phil Phyllis Bennis to Kansas State University. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm very glad to be here tonight. I never had the opportunity to know Lou Douglas, but from what I've learned about him, I think that he would have fit in very well at my institute. Like Lou Douglas, we try to merge intellectual work, analysis, information, ideas with action. We provide our work for an audience of the peace movement, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the environmental movements, the movements around the world that are searching for a better world. And we try to do our work, whether it's writing or speaking or traveling and organizing, in ways that empower those movements. And I think that's very much what Lou Douglas was all about. So I'm very honored to be here speaking in, in his memory. A day or two ago, I was in, I'm forgetting which city it was now, it was in Maine. Uh, it was, no, I almost said it was Portland. It wasn't Portland. It was Bangor, Maine. And I was meeting with the editor of the local newspaper. And he asked me a question no one had ever asked me before. And I thought it was an astonishingly prescient question. He asked me what I thought Americans misunderstand about the Middle East and U.S. foreign policy there. And I thought, boy, I wish more people stopped to ask that question because it's such an important issue. The issue of the Middle East is so much at the center of what is happening to our lives and the lives of so many around the world. And yet, 
what we think we know is so often shaped by wrong ideas, wrong information, lack of information, and it becomes very difficult to learn the real history, the real power relations in a situation like that. There was an article that emerged yesterday analyzing an even more disturbing trend than this general lack of information among so many of us that had to do specifically with an analysis. It was done by the, the uh, Center for the People and the Press at the University of Maryland, a very reputable polling operation. And they had polled a number of uh, supporters of President Bush in the election. And they had asked these supporters uh, their opinion, not about what they thought, although that was a later part of it, but of what they thought President Bush thought and what President Bush uh, believed and what were his policies. And among other things, they then, they then went on to, to ask what they believed to be the, the actual situation. So for example, 72% of the supporters of President Bush believe, and this poll was just three or four days ago, this was after the debates, after all of the information that has come out about the Dulfer report, the lack of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, 72% of President Bush's supporters in the election believe that Iraq had and has weapons of mass destruction or major viable programs to, to create them. 75% of them believe that Iraq was providing strategic aid to Al-Qaeda and was involved in September 11. 58% say that if there were no weapons of mass destruction, we should not have gone to war. And 61% believe that President Bush would not have gone to war had there not been weapons of mass destruction. Now what's so interesting about that and frightening is the coalescence of those two pieces of information. People were then asked, do you think we should have gone to war if there were no weapons of mass destruction? And a vast majority said, no, we should not. That's a good thing. People recognize that if there are no weapons of mass destruction, there's no basis for war. But the other side of it was they continue to believe, absent any recognition of the realities, that President Bush, one, would not have gone to war if there were no weapons of mass destruction, and two, believes that there are weapons of mass destruction and therefore they believe it too. This was, I think, a very... Um, disheartening, but a very important uh, poll for us to be thinking about. The elections have put issues of foreign policy, issues of the impact of foreign policy on us here at home, at the center of discussion and debate and discourse in a way that it rarely is in ordinary US society. One of the issues that has emerged in the recent period has been this question of empire. Is the US an empire? Is it driving towards empire? Is it building an empire? I think that it's a, it's a very interesting debate that has to do with economic definitions and political and military de definitions, how much expansion, what constitutes an empire. And I find those kinds of debates and discussions fascinating, you know, particularly late at night over a glass of wine. It's, it's a great debate. I'm not sure at this moment that we need to resolve that debate. I think that what is clear is that the US is driving towards an unprecedentedly unilateralist and militarist policy around the world, and a policy that has consequences not only in every country around the world, but dramatically consequences here at home. Traveling around the world, and I've been privileged in the last several years to do a great deal of traveling, particularly in the last couple of years in, in the process of building the global peace movement, I hear a single voice in every country that I go to. And in one version or another, what that voice says is, we are the subjects of your empire. We have no say, we have no voice, we have no impact on what happens in your country but everything that your government does has a dramatic impact on us. You, meaning us Americans, you are the citizens of empire. 
And you must vote for us. You must take us into account when you hold your government accountable for what it does around the world. I think that there is little or no debate about whether the US is driving towards a more unilateralist, more militarist policy around the world. I think there is little debate that international law is being abandoned, that the United Nations is being sidelined, that we are moving towards a state of permanent war, that we are told is something called a preemptive war, a war that is to make us safer. But what we find instead is that rather than making us safer, we are at far greater risk than we have ever been before. And that our so-called war of preemption is not a war of preemption at all, but is in fact a war of aggression. A war that the, the signers of the Nuremberg decisions recognized as the worst war crime because it is from aggression that all other war crimes stem. We are facing a scenario in which around the world a war of aggression, a preventive war, is on the move. And that kind of a war is thoroughly illegal. There is no doubt the right of every country to defend itself. Self-defense is written into the UN Constitution, the UN Charter. But self-defense does not exist solely when a country claims it exists. And self-defense is not infinitely expandable to go to war against any country for as long as one wants, for any pretext one chooses, without any consequence. The UN Charter that speaks of self-defense does so in Article 51. And it says very clearly, every nation has the right of self-defense. But that's not the end of the sentence, because it goes on to give two very important qualifiers or caveats to that right. It says that a nation has the right of self-defense if an armed attack occurs, not if we think that someday in the future somebody might get a weapon that they might give to someone else who might use it against us or somebody we like, no. It's if an armed attack occurs. And some people say in today's era of massive, horrific, fast weapons, that has to be interpreted to mean if an armed attack occurs or is about to occur. So fine, for the sake of argument, let's say that it includes that. It still didn't apply in the case of Iraq. And then there's another caveat as well, because it says that a country has the right of self-defense if an armed attack occurs until, until the Security Council can meet and decide what to do. Well, the Security Council was meeting and decided what to do about Iraq. Inspections and sanctions. And what a surprise, the inspections were actually working. The, in, the UN inspectors had come and briefed the Security Council and told them that they had found no evidence of weapons of mass destruction and that they needed just a short period of time more to confirm that they had finished the job and that there were no weapons anywhere else. And yet the US chose to go to war without UN authorization, without Security Council authority, in the face of global opposition, and in violation of the UN Charter. Now, was this a new policy? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. What was new was not the goals of this war, which had nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction, but had everything to do with the expansion of US power and oil and the drive towards empire. What was new was that after September 11, the level of fear throughout our country was so powerful that we were, as a nation, paralyzed, that we had lost much of our ability to think critically, so that when we were told that the only option that we had was to go to war, we said, yes, let's go to war, because the options that we were presented with were we either let them get away with it or we go to war. We were never offered any other option. We never had another choice. I don't think that people in Washington in positions of high power suddenly after 9-11 decided, oh, let's try and take over the world. 
I think that there were ideas that were floating around. There were and are people in Washington that are now in positions of great power who had been for many years committed to a campaign to increase U.S. power around the world, to dominate the politics, the military, the economic, the cultural, the diplomatic relationships of the world. And what changed after 9-11 was not their eagerness to do that, but their ability to impose their, what I consider, reckless and extremist agenda. This was a plan, after all, that has its roots in a paper that was written as far back as the early 1990s, in the immediate wake of the fall of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, when a group of what we now call often the neocons, what I consider the, the reckless ideologues of the Bush administration, were coming to the end of their role in the first Bush administration, and they drafted a paper that gave rise to something called the Project for the New American Century. You can find it on the internet. It's a fascinating document to read. And what the Project for the New American Century paper called for was essentially a militarized, expansionist, nuclearized United States where foreign policy would be rooted in, in military rather than diplomatic efforts, where the U.S. would make clear that no nation or group of nations would be allowed even to match, let alone supersede, our military capacity, our strategic reach, our economic clout, our cultural influence, our diplomatic capacity. And they turned over that paper to high-ranking officials in the Bush administration who took one look at it and said, you guys have to be nuts. This is all very nice, but the American people would never let us get away with it. And the paper was put on a shelf and more or less forgotten for 10 years except that the people who wrote it had not forgotten about it. The people who wrote it remained in touch with each other, and they, after 9-11, when they were once more ensconced in positions of high power in Washington, they went back to that paper and brought back many of the tenets that it had called for and said, now is our chance. Now, when people around the country are paralyzed, now when we have the opportunity of that paralysis to make Americans believe that they will somehow be safer in a world in which everyone else around the world is angry at the United States, is being intimidated by the United States, dominated by the United States, when international law is being abandoned as having an impact only on the others around the world and not on us, that somehow that will make us safer. And we can convince them of that because right now Americans are so frightened that they're not thinking at all. And unfortunately, they were right. The fear factor was ratcheted up higher and higher. Every time it began to diminish, every time we began to get back to something like normality, what happened? The color codes kicked in. And it went from green to yellow, and yellow to orange, and orange to red, and back to yellow, and back to orange. And yeah, people made fun of it. People said it was nonsense. But in the meantime, the fear was maintained. People remained fearful. The fear we know now was based on lies. Lies about weapons of mass destruction. Lies about mobile biological weapons laboratories. Lies about uranium yellow cake in Niger. Lies about uh, a host of, of, of claims. Lies about links between Iraq and Al-Qaeda. The problem is that many, many people believed them. And as this new poll that I mentioned earlier shows, many people believe them still. The lies played a very important role. They are lies that are rooted in fear. And one of the really unfortunate things is that because people have been so focused on these false claims, these claims based on lies, the fear has prevented us from recognizing the things that we really should be afraid of. And those are many. We should be very afraid of the consequences when our government violates international law. Our military is at great risk, and we should be very afraid for the GIs themselves when our government says that the Geneva Conventions don't apply. Because that means that every other country in the world that may capture one of our GIs is going to say the same thing and say, oh, well, if you don't accept the Geneva Conventions, why should we? 
we should be very afraid. We should be very afraid of how the claims that the war in Iraq is going to bring freedom and democracy to the Middle East has instead brought new levels of chaos, a second occupation to engender massive opposition, the rise of resistance forces. All of these things we should be very afraid. The increasing hatred around the world and almost the most important thing, the erosion of our own democracy. We should be very, very afraid of how we are losing our own civil liberties here at home. Our democracy is at a weak ebb. Our elections are at risk. We should be very, very afraid. And yet the fear of these false claims has blinded us to those real fears that are not being taken seriously. The last several weeks has been rather extraordinary in new reports in the, in the uh, New York Times, the Dulfer report to Congress, confirming lots of things that many of us have been saying for a long time. So the Dulfer report, Charles Dulfer, the head of the Iraq survey group who spent almost 10 years as a, as a UN arms inspector, now goes to work for the CIA, issues a thousand page long report saying, what a surprise, there were no weapons of mass destruction. Boy, we really expected there to be. Well, the problem is, like the report that the New York Times issued, three entire pages of the New York Times. Can you imagine all that print? You know, they never run an article that's three full pages long. But they did on the issue of the aluminum tubes. Remember the aluminum tube story? Condoleezza Rice was the big one on, on this one. The claim that Iraq was ordering and was, was, was importing these high-tech aluminum tubes. They could only be useful for making nuclear weapons. Their only value was in the effort to enrich uranium. It means it's one more piece of proof that Iraq is trying to rebuild its nuclear capacity and therefore we have to go to war against them. And at the time, people said from the UN, from within the former, former inspectors, former UN inspectors, all said that's simply wrong. These, these tubes are not useful for enriching uranium, but they are very useful for a kind of small rocket that Iraq has been making for a dozen years now, based on the model of an, of a, an Italian rocket that's still in, in place. And it's a small rocket that's actually within the parameters of what Iraq was allowed to build. So the New York Times spends three pages of print, which is a very good thing. I'm very glad the New York Times does it. But we have to be very clear, this isn't new information. When Charles Dulfer says suddenly, there are no weapons of mass destruction, and the Knight Ritter newspapers run a three piece, a three-part series on the mistakes in intelligence that led to the war and all the false claims that were made. This is great because it means that lots more people read about it, but it's not new information. We know from Charles Dulfer in the, the weapons of mass destruction uh, uh, claim, remember President Bush himself said, it doesn't matter whether or not Iraq has weapons of mass destruction, we're going to go to war anyway. One of the things that is included in the Dulfer report is a long list of US and other corporations who were involved in providing the basis for the Iraqi arms buildup throughout the 1970s, 80s, and through the 90s. That's a very interesting fact. The problem is, it's also not new information. This information, some of you will remember back in, in the, the fall of 2002, the final decision of the Security Council was that Iraq would be obligated to provide a full accounting of its weapons plans, of its weapons capacity, of its weapons of mass destruction programs. Remember that? And in fact, they did that. In early December of 2002, Iraqi diplomats came to New York to, pre to present to the Security Council and to the arms inspectors a huge dossier of what they said was the full and complete report. That full and complete report was 12,000 pages and five CD-ROMs long. It was presented to the president of the Security Council, who at that time was the president, uh, the, the uh, ambassador of Colombia, who coincidentally or not, had had a visit in his capital two days earlier from Colin Powell, who had suddenly announced the release of a long delayed $700 million aid package to Colombia. Maybe that was a coincidence, maybe not. But whether it was or not, the 
stack of 12,000 pages was immediately turned over to waiting U.S. diplomats who shuffled it onto a helicopter and flew off to Washington to make the copies for all the members of the Security Council. They said they had better copying equipment, like there were no Xerox machines in New York. But okay, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. The first part was to make copies of the entire report for the other four permanent members, China, Russia, France, and, the, and Britain. Those happened to be, the five permanent members, of course, happened to be the five acknowledged nuclear powers. And the agreement had been made within the Security Council that only the five nuclear powers would get the whole thing, that the other ten members of the Security Council would get an edited version. Why? Because everybody agreed that there was no reason to risk any information that might be in this report about how to build a nuclear weapon out into the world. Everybody agreed that made sense. But when, after an entire week goes by, the, the other four got their copies within 24 hours. The U.S. said it was an exact copy. Was it? We'll never know. But it took over a week for the other ten to get their copies. The edited version, right, taking out any references to how to build a nuclear bomb. Suddenly, a week later, the 12,000-page dossier had been reduced to 3,000 pages. Now, people started raising, were there 9,000 pages of how to build a nuclear bomb? And it remained a big mystery. It was all classified, nothing went public, for about two weeks. But then suddenly, a journalist in Germany got a leak of the bulk of the pages that had been edited out. And lo and behold, what did it turn out was on those pages? List after list of corporation after corporation from the United States, from Great Britain, from France, from Germany, from Russia, from China, from countries all around the world who had been responsible for Iraq's weapons programs throughout the 1970s, 80s, through the 90s, and right up through 2002. That's what was being protected. That's what we were being prevented from learning. So it's all very good that it's in Dolfer's report, but let's not pretend that it took 1,500 U.S. CIA inspectors to find that out. One other story about what we already knew. The whole issue of the weapons of mass destruction. We were told by U.S. government officials up to the highest level, Colin Powell, President Bush, we know Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Well, of course they knew that they had weapons of mass destruction. We kept the receipts, but that's a different matter. They said, we know that we had weapons of mass destruction because we had the best possible witness, the most credible. And in 1995, that witness came public. This was a man named Hussein Kamel. He had been the head of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program. He also happened to be the son-in-law of Saddam Hussein. That didn't prevent him from being murdered when he returned to Iraq. But in 1995, Hussein Kamel decided that he had had enough as the head of the weapons program and he went into exile. He defected. He went to Jordan and spent weeks being debriefed by the UN weapons inspectors. After he was debriefed by the weapons inspectors, he was turned over to the CIA and the British MI6 intelligence agencies, who spent more weeks interrogating him. And he had huge amounts of information about the weapon systems. He told us about the uh, the, the chemical weapons, he told us about the biological weapons, he told us about the uh, the, the missiles, about the efforts to build a nuclear weapon, it was all there. He told the inspectors about the so-called chicken farm, a place where they found a bunch more documents about what those, uh, what those in weapons had looked like. The problem was, and, and at that point, U.S. officials gleefully went public with all that. It was all over the press. Some of you, and I've been talking to classes all day where I have to remember that they weren't even reading in 1995. But I'm looking around the room and I'm seeing that a lot of you were around and reading in 1995 and you probably remember. There was a huge amount of publicity about this because it was, this was the Clinton administration. Keep in mind, this is an equal opportunity lies about weapons of mass destruction that we're talking about. It went on and on about how this proves how bad that regime was. It proves they had weapons of mass destruction. The problem was they were leaving out one small detail that they didn't go public with that Hussein Kamel, along with his long explanations about all the weapons of mass destruction programs that Iraq had, also just happened to mention 
that they had all been destroyed by the end of 1991. Now many of us never believed Hussein Kamel. I never did. I thought he had every reason to lie. He had every motivation to tell the inspectors that were debriefing him what they wanted to hear. He was looking for political asylum in the US or Great Britain. But people in our government did believe him. And they put it out to the press and made him the determinative ev uh, piece of evidence. You can't have it both ways. You can't say we believe everything he said, except for when he said that they destroyed those weapons. Oops, we just forgot about that. Again, this is in Dulfer's report. What a surprise. It appears, he says, this is the CIA's Dulfer, it appears that the weapons stockpiles were all destroyed by the end of 1991. Just what Hussein Kamel told his interrogators but what we were prevented from knowing. What is happening as we look at what has happened in the past, the lies, I'll tell you one other that's a little bit more recent, but it's an important one. We've been hearing a lot about condemnation of the United Nations for refusing to send in more election monitors and election experts. The UN says they won't go in as long as they are targeted because they will be seen as being part of the US occupation. And the U.S. is complaining that no countries will agree to provide protection to the United Nations. Well, it turns out in a, a scoop in Newsday newspaper uh, this past, I think it was last Monday, that there were a group of countries that were prepared to send a 1,500 strong battalion of troops specifically to protect the U.N. in Iraq. They were a group of Muslim countries led by Pakistan, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, and I think a few others I'm not sure of. And what happened? The US said, no, you can't. Why? Because they were not going to be under US command. They would be under United Nations command. And the Pentagon would have none of it. So when you hear these complaints by US government officials about how our allies are not willing to protect the UN, remember that. Remember who's willing and who's not, and who's preventing those willing from doing that job. So while all of this is going on in the world at large, what do we see going on on the ground inside Iraq? A very interesting piece a day or two ago in the New York Times by Zbigniew Brzezinski. You'll remember him. He was the former uh, national security advisor in the Carter administration, a well-known neocon, hawk, militarist, I don't agree with a lot of what's in his article, but let me read you one couple of lines. He says, after all, look what's happening in Iraq. For a growing number of Iraqis, their, quote, liberation from Saddam Hussein is turning into a despised foreign occupation. Nationalism is blending with religious fanaticism into a potent brew of hatred. The rates of desertion from the American-trained new Iraqi security forces are dangerously high. The rates, uh, uh, sorry, while the likely escalation of U.S. military operations against insurgent towns will generate a new rash of civilian casualties and new recruits for the rebels. That's what we see, it's quite accurate, going on on the ground in Iraq. We are told that the war was to liberate Iraq. Instead, with the overthrow of a dictatorship, that dictatorship has now been replaced by a military occupation. In the period, just in the, the few months since the so-called transition of power, the escalation in death and destruction has been dramatic. The number of international contractors killed in Iraq on a monthly basis has spiked from a little over seven a month average during the 14 months of the acknowledged occupation to over 17 a month these days, after the so-called transition. U.S. casualties are higher than ever. U.S. casualties went from a little over 400 a month to almost 750 a month in the period between the months of so-called Iraqi sovereignty compared to the months of acknowledged occupation. The elections that are ostensibly planned for January will very unlikely be able to take place because of skyrocketing violence around the country. 
the threat of a massive escalation in Fallujah looms again with the civilian population largely expelled from the city, many of the women and children of the city living outside the city limits because of the expectation that there will be another massive attack. And today we read on the front page of the New York Times that 380 tons of one of the most dangerous kinds of plastic explosive, conventional weapon, not a nuclear weapon, not a WMD, but the kind of weapon that was used to bring down Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie is now missing in Iraq. What had been under seal by the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, throughout the years of sanctions, the years of UN inspections, those seals were broken and the material was stolen apparently as soon as the US occupation began, when the IAEA was forced out of Iraq. And only now we are learning that that 380 tons of this material, this is a kind of material where I'm not a scientist, but as, I, as far as I know, something like a pound of it can blow up a car in a car bomb. Imagine what 380 tons could do. It also could be used in triggering nuclear uh, weapons if a nuclear weapon existed. We're only learning about this now. And of course, we now know that Iraq is now becoming what it never was before, and that is a center for global terrorism. As repressive as the regime of Saddam Hussein was at home, as brutal as that regime was, international terrorism was never its MO. If you look at the history, if you read the State Department's patterns of global terrorism, their annual report on international terror, you see Iraq barely exists on the radar screen. One allegation back in 1993, a disputed allegation, of Iraqi involvement in an act of international terrorism. That's it. It just wasn't what that regime was all about. It was about plenty of repressive moves, plenty of brutality, plenty of wars. But it wasn't about international terrorism. Now Iraq has become that centerpiece of international terrorism. The borders wide open, no protection of the borders. And of course, at the end of the day, we know that 15 times as many Iraqi civilians as USGIs are dying in Iraq, that is supposedly in a war to liberate them. There have now been over 1,100 USGIs killed in Iraq, and the estimates, they are only estimates because the Pentagon refuses on principle to track the number of Iraqi civilian dead, but a number of academics by reading and cross-referencing international media accounts have been able to keep up with a more or less accurate figure. That figure is now about 15 to 17,000 Iraqi civilians. That means 17 times the number of US soldiers are dying among Iraq's civilian population. We were told that this war was going to bring democracy to the entire Middle East. What do we see on the ground in the rest of the region? We see increased instability, increased militarism, the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territory becoming stronger, backed by the US. We now have what we might call dual occupations. Some of you will remember that in April of 2002, when the Israeli military reoccupied cities throughout the West Bank, and particularly in the city and refugee camp of Jenin in the northern West Bank, in a, in a massacre that led to the deaths of 59 Palestinians, of whom half were civilians, and of those, half were children under the age of 16. It was following that week-long attack that the Pentagon went to the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, and said, we want your soldiers to train our soldiers in how to occupy an Arab country, because we see now that you know how to do it. We want to do it the same way. And so all of the things that have characterized the Israeli occupation since 1967, the demolition of houses, the assassination of targeted individuals, the kidnapping of families of individuals hoping that they will turn, they will turn themselves in so that their families will be released, the destruction of olive trees, the imposition of curfews that provide a collective punishment specifically in violation of the Geneva Conventions on an occupied population, all of those things that have gone on with U.S. collaboration, U.S. funding, 
through our military and economic aid, protected by our diplomatic support in the United Nations, all of those things that have so long gone on in the occupied territories by the Israeli troops are now being carried out in Iraq directly by American troops. So what does that mean? It means that we have in these dual occupations a parallel level of responsibility. When we provide Israel with 25% of our entire foreign aid budget, a country of 6 million that happens to be the 17th wealthiest country in the world, when we provide the protection in the Security Council that ensures that Israel is not held accountable for its violations of international law, when we sell or give to Israel the F-16 fighter jets, the Apache helicopters, the Hellfire missiles, the armored D-9 bulldozers made by Caterpillar, everyone in the region knows what role the United States is playing. And I think it's very important that we recognize what the consequences are, not only there, but here as well, because it's the antagonism towards us that will come back to haunt us for generations to come. I think in many ways, September 11 was as shocking as it was and as surprising as it was, because it was shocking to everyone around the world. The horror of it, the scale of it, the scope of it, the cruelty of it, everyone was shocked. But only here in the United States, I think, were we also surprised, surprised that such a thing might even be contemplated because for so long we had imagined that we were somehow immune, that our government could do whatever it wanted anywhere in the world, that our policies could have whatever deleterious impact on anyone in the world, and that there would be no consequences for us, because for so long there had been no consequences. So we were surprised, as well as shocked. But we have to be very clear what the impact of this war has been on us here at home as well. The $151 billion that this war has cost, imagine what we could do with it here in our own communities. We could put 20 million children into Head Start. We could pay for health care for 82 million American children without health insurance. We could pay for 3 million new elementary school teachers. But instead, what is happening, our countries, our, our communities are less safe. Our first responders, firefighters, ambulance drivers, emergency technicians, police officers, are disproportionately represented in the, in the reservists and, and National Guard that are deployed to Iraq. 44% of local police forces today are missing officers because they're being deployed in Iraq. It makes our families, our communities less safe. Every one of our households in this country will be paying on average $3,415 for this war over the next three years. We have in our military the understanding among many soldiers and their families that morale is not only at an all-time low, that re-enlistment is at an all-time low. Families in organizations like Military Families Speak Out are hearing from their loved ones in Iraq, in the region about to go to Iraq, returning from Iraq, coming back wounded from Iraq, and the families of those who have already been killed in Iraq, saying, this is not what we signed up for. Yes, we volunteered for this military, but we volunteered for the military to protect our Constitution and to keep Americans safe. And instead, what we're being asked to do violates our Constitution and is making every American less safe. This most recent incident of soldiers refusing to carry contaminated fuel in a dangerous zone in unprotected trucks that were not even capable of making the trip, I think is only the tip of the iceberg. We are going to see far more. The parallels with the Vietnam quagmire are becoming greater and greater. And we are going to pay the kind of price that we paid in Vietnam. The number of young GIs that are coming back already being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder is already vastly higher than the numbers who came back diagnosed so soon after Vietnam. If you all remember, after Vietnam, it took years for most people who later would be diagnosed with that disorder. Now people are coming back and being diagnosed within days of their return. Higher percentages than ever are coming back with emotional and mental illnesses, coming back with horrific physical ailments. The body armor 
that in many cases was only available because families found it on the internet and sent it by post to their loved ones in Iraq, is indeed keeping people alive. But they are coming back with the kinds of wounds where young people waking up with those wounds ask themselves, why did I have to still be alive? Multiple amputees, two legs and an, arms and an arm gone, two arms and a leg, all four limbs gone, brain injuries, eyes gone. The effect on those young people who are coming back, the effect on their families, the effect on our communities, the financial cost of caring for them for the rest of our lives is going to be a classic example of the cost coming home to us. In the rest of the world, people see the rise in global terrorism, the rise in threats. The International Institute of Strategic Studies in London, one of the most prestigious international military institutes in the world, when asked what has been the effect of the war in Iraq on al-Qaeda, answered accelerated recruitment. By their estimates, the number of, of active members of al-Qaeda have gone from 1,000 to 18,000 since the time that the war in Iraq began. The coalition of the willing that we heard so much about is in fact a coalition of the coerced. When it first was put together, it represented a mere 19% of the world's population. Today, if you add up the populations of all of the nations fighting in Iraq, including the United States, it's less than 13%. It is stripping global democracy and making everyone around the world less safe. The $151 billion that we're spending on the war, what could it pay for if we spent it globally? Well, it's a dr pretty dramatic combination of things. It would pay for food for half the hungry people in the world for two years, and a global AIDS education and treatment program, and a clean water system for the entire developing world, and childhood immunizations for every child in the global south. Now, if we did all that, imagine how much safer we would be when those educated, well-nourished, healthy children grew up instead of going to war. Imagine. So what do we have? Is this an empire? I think we're pretty close if it isn't already. But we do know, whether it is or not, that the U.S. today is more powerful than any country has ever been ever in history. We should be setting an example. Instead, we are saying that we are exempt. We are exempt from international law. We are exempt from the strictures of the United Nations. We are exempt from disarmament treaties. We can walk away from the Kyoto Protocol. We can abandon the ABM Treaty. We can say no to the International Criminal Court. And if we do all those things, what message do we send? What message do we send to everyone else in the world? The plan to expand U.S. power is at the root. The 14 permanent military bases that the U.S. is constructing in Iraq, we're not hearing too much about them. When we hear from President Bush, we will stay in Iraq as long as we need to and not one day sooner. We're not hearing about those permanent bases. Are we going to pull out from those bases? Turn it over to a government in Iraq, even if that government is made up of social and political forces we don't like very much? I don't think so. We are holding other countries accountable to laws that we hold ourselves unaccountable to. It is, I, I spoke today in one of the classes here at KSU, about the, the story, the ancient story of the Melian Dialogues. Some of you will remember that story. The ancient Athenians cause a decision to be made. They've created a democracy for the first time. It's limited. It's a democracy for men and not for women, for rich and not for poor, but okay, it's a start. It's a small, fragile democracy. And they decide that their democracy is threatened and they need land to protect their democracy. So they go to the island of Milos and they say, we're taking your island. And the Melians say, we don't think so. And the Athenians come back with, well, sorry, we're bigger and stronger than you. We're taking your island. And the Melians say, but what about democracy that you guys are so big on? And the answer comes back, for us, there is democracy. For you, there is the law of the powerful, the law of empire. I think that is what we're dealing with today. But like all empires, there are challenges to empire. And in the last few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about those challenges because this is what gives me hope. And I think 
when we look around the world, we can see where those challenges are coming from. There's a way in which we could look at September 11 as one kind of challenge to empire, the kind that has brought down empires of the past with blood and fire, with great violence from outside. But I think there are other options to change an empire, to return to our democracy, to reclaim our democracy. We can't do it alone. Many of you will remember the extraordinary peace mobilization of February 15th of last year, of 2003, when people in 665 cities all around the world gathered to say no to war. And they got together on one day to send a message to the United States, don't go to war. And two days later, the New York Times did something it almost never does. It told the truth on the front page above the fold. And it said, there are once again two superpowers in the world, the United States and global public opinion. Now, I think that was actually only half the story. Global public opinion was the crucial element that made possible the creation of a second superpower, but it wasn't the demonstrators alone. It was the demonstrations in the context of putting enough pressure on governments all around the world to give them the backbone to say no to war. So in the Security Council, you had not only the powerful countries, France, Germany, Russia, saying no to war, you had smaller, poorer, weaker, dependent countries also prepared to take the consequences and say no to war. Guinea, Cameroon, Angola, Chile, Mexico. These were not countries that ordinarily go head to head with the United States. But they were prepared to pay the price because the price domestically of giving in to US pressure was suddenly higher than the price to say no. And when you had so many countries preparing to say no, you then had the United Nations itself standing at the center of the mobilization for peace and the opposition to war. There was an extraordinary moment at the UN on February 14th, the day before the demonstrations, when the Security Council was meeting to hear the final reports, what turned out to be the final reports, of the UN arms inspection teams. So Mohamed el Baradai, the head of the IAEA, and Hans Blix, the head of UNMOVIC, the, UN, the two UN teams, told the Security Council that they had found no evidence of weapons of mass destruction. They needed a short amount of time to confirm their findings. But there was no smoking gun. There was no evidence that the US could point to and say, you see, we told you there were weapons of mass destruction, and now there's proof. There was no proof. There were no weapons. And in response, the French foreign minister said something very interesting. He said, the United Nations must be an instrument for peace. We must not use it as a tool for war. And something extraordinary happened in the council at that moment. A wave of applause, led by the diplomats themselves, swept across the council chamber, which never laughs, never acknowledges. But at that moment, the passion was so powerful that a wave of applause, unprecedented in UN history, swept across the, the council chamber. And the next morning, as people were beginning to gather outside the United Nations for what would become a demonstration of half a million people, a small group led by the South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu crossed the frozen zone. It was frozen in two ways. It was frozen by the police to keep it clear, and it was frozen in temperature, the coldest day of the year. A small group led by Bishop Tutu went into the UN to meet with Secretary General Kofi Annan. And the first thing that Bishop Tutu said to the Secretary General was, we are here today on behalf of the people that are marching in 665 cities around the world. And we're here to tell you that those people marching in all those cities, we claim the United Nations as our own. And we claim it in the name of the global mobilization for peace. It was an extraordinary moment. And I think that when we look around the world, when we see that movement rising in Europe, in Asia, throughout Africa, Latin America, all around the world, a movement saying no to war. We can learn lessons from that. We can learn lessons from the people of Spain who responded to a horrific terrorist attack by saying that the government that had put them in harm's way did not deserve to stay in power, and that the government that had gone to war in the face of 95% opposition of the Spanish people should be thrown out. And indeed, they threw out the government that had put them in harm's way. And I think that we have lessons to learn from Spain. I will leave you 
I know that there are organizations here, the, the Kansas State Alliance for Peace and Justice, which has a table outside, peace movements based in churches across the state and others. The work that we do here is very, very important. And as we do it, we are part of that global movement, part of that global mobilization for peace. We are linking those subjects of empire with our role as the citizens of empire. We have a lot of responsibilities. There's one other ancient saying that perhaps is, is relevant here from another empire. When the, the Roman writer Tacitus followed the Roman legions as they laid waste to cities throughout the territory that the empire controlled, at one point he climbed a hill above a valley where there had been a, a devastating war. And he looked down on it and he wrote later, the Romans brought devastation, but they called it peace. It's our job to make sure our government doesn't try to do that as well. Thank you. So we have time for some questions. I know you're all waiting to buy the books afterwards. But we have time for questions. There's mics down here. Um, come, ask. Hi. Um, is your group concerned at all about how the UN is very undemocratic in a lot of ways? I mean, with mm -hmm. the Security Council being only five members who can basically do whatever they want, and are, are you working for a better system, trying to, you know, actually have a world system that would work? Absolutely. We're very concerned about that. Um, my last book before this new one is called Calling the Shots, How Washington Dominates Today's UN. And it's very concerned about the question of UN democracy. The UN is very undemocratic in lots of different ways. The, the most egregious, of course, is the Security Council, the existence of the veto, not representing the realities of today's world, reflecting the realities of the victors of World War II who were going to claim the peace as they had won the war. Um, and I think that we need to redefine what UN reform means. People talk a lot about UN reform in the context of, of Security Council reform, ending the veto, expanding those who hold the veto, and I think those are very good ideas. I don't think they're going to happen anytime soon. So I think in the meantime, what can work is to empower the, the General Assembly, including on issues that ordinarily belong solely to the Council. But the, count, the, the General Assembly, which is also not a perfect democracy, it gives one country one vote, whether it's a huge country like China or India, or a tiny country like uh, Micronesia. That's not exactly democratic, but the world is organized on the basis of nation states, so it's a little closer to democracy, than, certainly than the Security Council. So I think there's a lot of room there. The other thing that we've been fighting about at the UN for years is the whole question of having a role for civil society so that the UN is no longer just governments. Corporations are now getting a foothold at the UN, which many of us have been fighting against. We have to fight to get a real foothold for people, for organizations, not just to be able to go to the meetings, but to be part of the meetings, part of the decision making. So I think the issue of UN reform is a very, very important one. I would just say one other point about the UN. One of the things, you know, despite all of the anti-UN campaigns that have come out of Washington in recent years, the American people tend to support the UN in massive numbers, far more than it probably deserves even. People like the UN and understand that it's important. One of the ways that I think it's important that we don't often think about is it's a venue for us to find out what other countries think about us. We don't often hear that. The, the um, poll that I mentioned earlier, let me just see where it is. The, the poll that I mentioned had an extraordinary other um, piece of information about the number of, uh, 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 well, it was how, this again was a poll of supporters of President Bush. And what they believe is the situation around the world. And it was rather frightening. They believe, I'll see if I can find the exact numbers, but a huge number believe that people around the world support the war in Iraq, that people around the world uh, are in favor of our policies, 
and they have no idea how low is the actual support for what the U.S. is doing around the world, how isolated we are. One of the things we really should be afraid of. Um, well, I'm, I don't want to waste time looking for it now. I have the article here. Anybody who wants to, we can, I'll show it to you afterwards. But it's rather staggering. And I think it's, it's a very serious thing that we have to take into account, that people in our country simply don't know just how isolated we really are and how our policies, especially of the last three years, have isolated us even further. Hi. Uh, first, I want to say thank you for coming and speaking here. Thank you. Um, my question is, you speak very highly of the United Nations and international law. Where are we supposed to find our confidence in these organizations when they can't come about to denounce international terrorism any, of any form, can't denounce genocide in Darfur, and when the Secretary General of the United Nations is, is being accused of skimming money off the top of the oil for food program? Well, first of all, the Secretary General is not being accused of any such thing. The accusation is that his son was at an earlier time a, uh, uh, an employee of a company in Switzerland that was doing part of the, the inspections. In my view, it, it looks terrible, and it was a mistake, clearly, to have any, country, any company that had anyone from the UN involved in that. I agree with the appearance of it. But there is no allegation against the Secretary General. And in fact, there's no allegation against his son. It's the appearance of inappropriate links. That's the, that's the only thing. So we need to be very clear about that. Um, the UN has lots of problems. I believe in the UN, but I don't believe in the UN as it stands today. I think it has all kinds of weaknesses that need to be challenged. But, and part of it has to do not with its refusal to oppose international terrorism. There are 12 separate Security Council resolutions that call for specific actions having to do with money trails and a bunch of other things, uh, specifically on the question of international terrorism. On the question of Darfur and, and uh, the genocide issue, you're absolutely right. However, I think that we have to be very clear that the debate over whether or not the situation in Darfur was in fact genocide was in many ways a cover for the fact that countries were not prepared to allow the United Nations to function whether or not it was called a genocide. There was a belief, and I think it's a very unfortunate reality, that people thought that if we can just get them to call it genocide, which it clearly was, that somehow that would mean they were prepared to do something. Those two things didn't go together. The Genocide Convention does say that if there is a finding of genocide, that there is the obligation to prevent or stop that genocide. But the same obligation exists in the context of the Geneva Conventions. So they were already obligated. The US was obligated. Every member of the Security Council was obligated. Every member of the General Assembly was obligated to stop that genocide, whether or not they wanted to use the word. So it became this almost artificial debate where the whole issue is, and Kofi Annan spoke to this, I think, quite eloquently when he went to Darfur and said, we should not get caught up in the debate over what to call this. There are massive crimes going on. We have to stop them. That should be the discussion, not what word is used. And I think that was true. The UN has not, come, has not been able. But we have to be very clear what it means to say, the UN has failed. It was the same thing in the question of the Rwandan genocide in 1994. The UN did not stop that genocide. But why was that? It was because the United States and France refused to allow the bolstering of the tiny little contingent of UN peacekeepers who were allowed to be only in the area surrounding the, the airport. They were faced with the choice, as were the UN peacekeepers, the Dutch peacekeepers in Srebrenica. They had the unenviable choice of either standing aside and allowing genocide to occur or violating their mandate and violating international law. That's not the situation that any UN peacekeeper should be in. They were not allowed to do the job that they might have under other circumstances. So the question of failure is a very real one. But we have to be very clear in asking what made that failure inevitable? Who was responsible? And in both of those cases, the US is very much not the only responsible party, but one of the main ones. Another question. You've made the case over the past hour that the United States shouldn't have gone to war in Iraq specifically because it was violating UN charters and the self-defense clause, uh, et cetera. I is it then your contention that Saddam Hussein should still be in power in Iraq uh, specifically because or 
because he was committing genocide against Shiites, Kurds, and innocent civilians, especially since the UN alternative to war, as you stated, was sanctions, which uh, a UN report stated that U.S. sanctions killed one child every eight minutes in Iraq for the entirety of their duration. The sanctions were a form of genocide. Sure. You're absolutely right. I don't think that people in Iraq who were thrilled with the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, appropriately thrilled, signed up for military occupation as the alternative. And I don't think that we have the right to expect them to welcome that. The U.S. was more responsible than any other government for putting and keeping Saddam Hussein in power, for making that government more than anything more than just one more tin pot dictatorship of which there are so many that we have supported for so long. It was the U.S. that provided Iraq with the biological seed stock to make the biological weapons that we now use as a precursor for war. It was our allies in, in Germany that provided the chemical precursors to make the chemical weapons. It was the Brits that provided the growth medium for the biological weapons. We have a lot to atone for in our relationship with Iraq. The chemical weapons that the regime used against Iranian troops illegally, illegal chemical weapons, would have been useless if it were not for the targeting, satellite-based targeting information provided by the U.S. military in the late 1980s. That's what made it ruthless. That's what made it possible to carry out the kinds of attacks that were carried out. We needed to have stopped those attacks long ago. Many of us were involved in demonstrations and mobilizations to stop U.S. support for that regime in the, in the early 1980s. Unfortunately, our government didn't listen to those demands and continued to support that regime and make it more powerful. Provided money, you all remember the BCCI scandal, through agricultural credits, military assistance, economic and political assistance, because we were more afraid of what was happening in Iran under the Iranian revolution than we were what was going on in Iraq. So we supported Iraq in the context of the Iran-Iraq war and made that government something much more dangerous than it otherwise would have been. Would Iraq have the same government? Would it still have Saddam Hussein in power if we had not gone to war? If all of our policies had been the same, probably yeah, but not forever, not forever. I think that if we had not had those policies, the possibility of the Iraqi people themselves overthrowing that regime and installing something else, whether it would have been what we like to think of as democracy or not, I don't know, it's not up to us to say, but another kind of government I think is absolutely a possibility. It was U.S. support for all those years that made it impossible. And then after the war, the first U.S. war in 1991, the sanctions devastated the population, as you rightly point out. The sanctions were devastating. They did kill more people than this war has killed. And many of us spent 10 years fighting against those sanctions. We didn't fight against the sanctions in order to get a war and a military occupation to replace them. People in Iraq didn't challenge and fight against the sanctions and fight against Saddam Hussein as best they could in order to have that replaced by a military occupation. It's not a reasonable choice, and we shouldn't have to make that choice. It's the same thing as we faced when our president told us that the only choice is, after September 11, we let them get away with it or we go to war. Those are not the only choices. They are not the only choices. The question was asked of me how to differentiate between the fear mongers in D.C. and the government and um, people like you who go out and speak to speak up and how to differentiate the fear that peacemakers, I guess you could say, place on citizens when they say that the government's lying to them and you actually have more to fear than just the orange or yellow codes. That's a really good question. Um, it's a hard question. I think what, what I try to do and what I think a lot of peace activists try to do is give people the kind of information that makes possible a different response to the fear so that we don't face the fear with paralysis. You know, when we're told that the only option is to go to war and you have to be really afraid but there's nothing you can do about it so go shopping, which is essentially what we were told. You know, if you're going to do anything, go buy duct tape and plastic sheeting and then go shopping, you know. 
this is not something that is empowering. The voices, voices of students in particular, voices of young people in particular, are so critical in this time. And I think that having the information to be able to challenge what we're being told without information should be a kind of empowering thing. Um, I, I hope that's what it is. I mean, I think that it's very difficult to look at simply what's on the front pages of the newspapers and think we're going to be able to get solid information. Because what comes at us is not only what we read in the newspaper, what we see on the news. It's in the culture, it's, in, it's like osmosis. You know, we absorb the fear, we absorb the, the sense that there's nothing we can do, the helplessness of it. And we're not helpless. We're not helpless. We can vote, certainly, but we can do a lot more than vote. We can provide education to people, we can provide information, we can demand that our teachers teach wider ranges of, of sources and materials, we can ask our churches and synagogues and mosques to, to become centers of debate and discussion, we can have our social organizations and trade unions and professional associations and whatever become debate centers as well. We have options, we have the capacity to change things. One of the amazing things that happened in the run-up to the war was the creation of something called the Cities for Peace campaign. And we had ultimately 165 cities around the country from you know little enclaves of anti-war sentiment like Berkeley or Madison, Wisconsin or something, all the way to every major industrial city in the country. Cleveland, uh, uh, Chicago, Los Angeles, Detroit, uh, New York, you name it, uh, Atlanta, a bunch of cities, Seattle, Portland, every city but uh, Houston it was the only one who didn't, didn't vote for it ultimately. But they all passed resolutions, they were all different and you know, different emphasis and whatever, but they all passed resolutions that said, we will not support a war that is an illegal unilateral war without United Nations approval. They understood the role of the United Nations and the primacy of that. That was a hugely empowering thing because it involved people at the local level. It was local activists lobbying members of the city council. It wasn't, you know, trying to figure out how can we go to Washington, how can we find... It was right there, right in communities, in cities, small towns, big cities, all over the place. And it was a hugely empowering thing for a lot of people who worked on that campaign to know that they were part of something bigger, something broader. The global peace movement, I think, gives me that same kind of sense of connection to things. It reduces the fear. It reduces the fear. There are things we should be afraid of, but there are things that we can stop. You know, we can demand of our government that it change policies. And while I don't believe that changing policies can necessarily prevent every single terrorist attack, every attack by a crazed, pathological individual, I think what changing the policies can do is make it almost impossible for people who might contemplate such a thing to gain any support from anybody else. What we saw after 9-11 was frightening not only because of what happened on that day, but because so many people around the world, even some of the same people who said, we stand with you in human solidarity in your moment of grief, we stand with you, some of those same people were also saying, but you know, I can kind of understand why it happened. That's what we can change. That's what we can change. We may not be able to prevent every act by a crazed individual, but we can make sure that they are isolated and they have no support. And that makes it much more difficult for them to carry out such a heinous attack. So that makes us safer, not, not less safe. Other questions? We have time for a couple more, I think. Do you see the UN's future as like a hegemonic role within global society and what steps can the UN take to you know, slow down nuclear proliferation? Oof, two Sorry. good questions. Yeah. Um, I don't see the UN becoming a hegemonic power. I, I, th I don't see a shift in the um, uh, division of the world into nation states, at least in my lifetime. Now, maybe you younger folks, maybe. Um, but I, I don't see that anytime, anytime soon. I, th I hope that the UN becomes more empowered. I hope as it becomes more democratic, it will become more empowered, that there will be a voice and not only a silent place outside the room for civil society. 
to be part of that. I hope that there is a resumption of focus on the, uh, what is in the charter as the military staff committee, the idea of a UN deployable rapid reaction force that could actually do things like go to Darfur and stop the genocide under the command of the Secretary General and not have to wait for the US and France and Russia and China to agree. So I hope all of that happens. I don't see it imminently. On the question of nuclear weapons, I think the key there, we have the framework for it. The Non-Proliferation Treaty provides a very good beginning, but the part of it that's so important gets ignored, and that is Article 6, which says that the obligation of the five existing nuclear powers is to move towards full and complete nuclear disarmament. Without disarmament, non-proliferation doesn't mean anything. You can't just stop proliferating if you've already got it. You've got to have both non-proliferation and disarmament. And as long as our government laughs at the prospect of disarmament, we can't expect non-proliferation to work either. And we, as we see, it doesn't. There are now eight acknowledged nuclear powers. Well, Israel isn't quite acknowledged, but almost acknowledged. As well as Korea may well be a nuclear power. What message does that send to the rest of the world? Not least if we look at the difference between how Iraq was treated. Iraq gets invaded when it had no nuclear weapons. Korea doesn't get invaded when it does. You know, what's that message? Get yourself a nuke and you'll protect yourself from invasion. So we have a lot of work to do right here on the question of disarmament and the non-proliferation treaty. One more question. I was uh, concerned about you talked about empire and stuff, but the basic motivation behind empire is money. But if you have to look around the world, we have something that's globalization out there, thereby you know, the power is slowly changing out. If you see the U.S. Uh, deficits and our trade deficits, I mean, I don't think a single company is surviving in this country. Nearly all countries are going out. Nearly all our treasuries are being purchased by countries like China or even some extent to country from, from India. And saying that we, and what I'm saying to saying is that U.S. might be able to do it, but I think in the long run, it's probably not, will not be able to do it because the slowly power, economic power, which it tries to put on others, it's making it dependent on each other. It's probably, we're looking, going to look at a mm -hmm. time bomb, which might explode. I think you raise a very important point. The U.S. efforts towards empire are not necessarily going to succeed in the long run, specifically in the interest of the American people. I disagree with you, I think, on the notion of corporations that are staying here. There are some corporations, Halliburton, Bechtel, the oil companies, and particularly the arms industry come to mind, that are doing very, very well through this war, that are doing very, very well through this drive towards empire. Globalization as a process, I think, has not yet gotten to the point where it is diminishing the power of states. Uh, I think we have to be very careful not to imagine that corporations exist kind of in disembodied cyberspace. They are rooted in, in countries, and companies stand or fall somewhere. So I think that that intersection between the rise of global corporations and the international financial institutions who represent their interests, and the states and the militaries that defend their interests are going still in a, in a global uh, parallel trajectory. They are both still crucial. The direction might be greater for the, the corporations later, but I think we haven't seen the end of nation states yet. The, the, the drive towards empire still has a lot of military and, and political sides, regardless of the, of the twists and turns of globalization at this stage. But thank you. Thank you all.